Today I want to talk about the social discount rate, which is probably the most important value in environmental policy that you've never heard of. In class, we'll talk a lot more about how and why we might want to use some form of benefit-cost analysis in thinking about environmental choices. But here, let's take for granted that we've decided that it makes sense to consider the costs and benefits of a policy before deciding if we want to undertake it. And let's further assume that we can even do that, for example, that we can estimate the value of things like ecosystem services, human lives, convenient transportation, and so on. Even then, we're not out of the woods because we still have to ask the question about how we should compare costs and benefits today with costs and benefits in the future. The problem is that we can't just say $100 today is worth $100 at any time in the future because almost none of us really believe that. Let's say someone came to the city of Des Moines and said that they had a great deal for us. If the city would pay them $100,000 today, they would commit to setting up a fund to pay the city $1 every year forever. Well, if we value money in the future the same as we value it today, then you might imagine that's a really great deal. After the first 100,000 years, that's all just free money. The sun's got billions of years left before it burns out, so we stand to make billions off of this investment long term. Still, most people wouldn't take the deal for several reasons. One is uncertainty. We don't really know for certain that this legal deal will last forever. We don't know if Des Moines will last forever. And we don't know if money will last forever. Just think how dumb we'll feel if we invest all that money and in a thousand years, Bernie Sanders' great, 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 great granddaughter outlaws capitalism and suddenly we've thrown away like $99,000. The point is that uncertainty about the future is one reason why people in societies often prefer a sure thing today versus something in the future. If we all make ourselves miserable fighting climate change today and then a meteor destroys the planet next year, won't we all feel stupid that we didn't just enjoy ourselves before the wheels came off? So that's a reason, but there are lots of others. The most obvious is that it's a bad investment. If I invested that $100,000 in stocks rather than in this guy's lame scheme, I'd expect something like $5,000 a year in average returns. So there's no way it would make sense to only get a dollar a year. Also, think about the Des Moines residents who will be getting that dollar a year in benefits a thousand years from now. They'll be flying around the universe at warp speed using computers built out of suns to play 10D full immersion Super Smash Brothers and live such great lives that it's crazy to think of taking a dollar from me where I need it just to get a cup of coffee and give it to those jerks who have everything. That's like taking from the poor and giving to the rich. Of course, there's also the obvious fact that I probably won't vote to pay for it because I won't be around to enjoy that free buck a year in 200,000 years. But economists are split on whether it's morally acceptable to take my temporal selfishness into account. Anyway, these aren't the only reasons, but most experts agree that at least because of uncertainty, economic growth, and the opportunity cost of money, having money today is at least somewhat better than having that same amount of money sometime in the future. The measure of how you, much you prefer money today rather than in the future is called the discount rate. And we usually think of it as a fixed fraction per year, much like interest rate in reverse. How much better money today is than money in the future is a really difficult question to answer. If I were asking that question of a business, it would be easy. I can just use the expected return on capital. So if the return that I'm going to get in the future is greater than what I'd expect from an investment, taking into account risk and such, then I'll take it, otherwise I'll pass. Usually the return on capital is something like 8%, which of course is why businesses are usually happy to take out loans at 5% and invest the money. The money's more valuable to them today than it will be in the future, because they expect money today will turn into more money in the future. So the discount rate is the amount by which money would have to grow in the future for me to be exactly indifferent between taking that amount and the base value today. For simplicity, we'll always talk about different pots of money in constant dollar terms, meaning after inflation has been taken out of the equation. So if I say a person has a discount rate of 0%, that means that I'm indifferent between receiving a sum of money today and the inflation adjusted equivalent sum in the future. So the discount rate is not a function of inflation. Write that down, because otherwise half of you are going to get it wrong on, wrong on the exam. Anyway, if a business has a discount rate of 8% and they see an opportunity to invest $10,000, how much would they need to make on an investment for it to be worth their while? Well, 
$800 is 8% of $10,000. So if they were going to wind up with anything over $10,800 next year, they'd do it, and anything less than $10,800, they wouldn't do it. Let's use that insight to come up with an equation for using the discount rate to compare money today with money in the future. In order to be indifferent between money today and money next year, I'd need my money to grow by D, or the discount rate, or 8%. Let's say Z0 is my pile of money today, and Z1 will be my pile of money next year. If D is my discount rate, then I'll be indifferent between the two pots of money if Z1 is equal to Z0 times 1 plus D. In other words, I'm indifferent between the two pots of money if Z1 is greater than, or I'm sorry, is equal to Z0 by a factor of 1 plus D. So, if D is 8% and Z0 is $10,000, then Z1 would have to be $10,800 for it to be the same in my mind, in other words, equal to $10,000 today. What if I wanted to figure out how much I'd need to spend after two years? Well, I can't just add another 800 because the money compounds, just like interest from the bank. I expect to need more money in the second year since I have more money to start with. So, if I want to know how much I would need uh, for Z2 to be equivalent to Z1, I'd use the same equation, Z2 equals Z1 times 1 plus D. Now, if I want to know what Z2 is in terms of Z0, I just substitute in for Z1 here, since they're equivalent. In other words, Z2 equals Z1 times 1 plus D, which is the same as Z0 times 1 plus D times 1 plus D, which is the same as Z0 times 1 plus D squared. I can do the same thing for a year after that. Z3 is equal to Z2 times 1 plus D, which is equal to Z0 times 1 plus D squared times 1 plus D, which is the same as Z0 times 1 plus D cubed. Hopefully by now you can see that the general equation for Z at some time T is going to be Z sub T equals Z0 times 1 plus D raised to the power of T. Now, here's the fun thing. Let's say someone comes to me and offers to sell me a bond that'll be worth $20,000 10 years in the future and wants to know how much I'd pay her today in exchange for that bond. What do I say? Well, the question I could ask is, what's $20,000 in 10 years worth today? In this case, I know Z sub 10, which is $20,000, and I want to know what the equivalent Z0 is today. Well, luckily, we're all good at algebra, so we just take the equation we've written, z sub t equals z0 times 1 plus d raised to the power of t, and rearrange it to z0 equals zt divided by 1 plus d to the t. In our case, zt is 20,000, and 1 plus d is 1.08, so z0 equals 20,000 divided by 1.08 raised to the 10, which is $9,264. If I can get bonds for less than that, I'll take them, but if they cost more, then it's not worth it. Another name for Z0 when we use it like this is net present value, the value in the present of costs or benefits accruing in the future. It's a bit more complicated with individuals, but still not too bad. Usually our discount rate changes over time for a number of reasons. For example, when they're young, most people have a high discount rate. It makes sense. If you're in college, for example, you're spending a lot of money and not making much. That's smart. You're investing in your future. But you imagine that after school, you'll get a job, at least if you're in a smart field like environmental science and sustainability. So money's going to come much more easily to you then. That means you'd need a pretty huge return in order to invest today when you have very little money, just so that you'll have more money in the future when you'll hopefully have plenty anyway. On the other hand, you sometimes hear about elderly people who stash away cash under their mattresses because they don't trust banks. That means they have a negative discount rate. They'd rather have that money to use in the future rather than now, so they're okay with it losing value to inflation as long as it's a sure thing that it'll be there for them when they want it. Now with governments, it's complicated. Let's say that we want to know how much we should spend to avoid damages that aren't going to happen for 100 years. For example, to avoid the flooding of a coastal community. One way we could think about it would be to ask how much will the damages cost residents of that community, assuming we could properly take into account all the costs. And then we could just ask whether it will be more expensive to deal with the problem then by paying them for the damages or pay for it now by avoiding the problem. As you might expect, 
we can just discount the damages to the present day to figure out how much they're worth. But what's the right discount rate? For a long time, policymakers just used the average rate of return on the stock market, 7 or 8 percent. The idea here was this. Let's say we want to avoid a million dollars worth of damages in 100 years, and that we can do it with a government program today that costs just $10,000. Should we do the project? Well, the net present value of a million dollars in 100 years at an 8% discount rate is NPV equals 1 million divided by 1.08 raised to the 100 equals $455, meaning that we would only value we would only value a million dollars in 100 years at $455 today. That may seem really low, but it's also true that if we invested $455 today and got an average rate of return on that investment, we'd have a million dollars in 100 years. That's the beauty of compounding. Of course, if we waited 50 years, we'd only have 21,000, so that second 50 years gets you a lot more than the first one. But anyway, the thinking was this. Why pay $10,000 on a project when we would be better off investing $500 in stock and just paying people for their losses when they happened? The future's better off because now they have more than a million dollars and the present is better off because they saved $9,500 oh, $9, by not having to pay for the project. The main problem with this line of thinking is that it's never what happens. The government doesn't tax people today, invest the money, and pay people for problems in the future. Maybe in an economist's mind this would be the optimal solution, but it just doesn't happen, and honestly if we tried it it would probably get messed up when someone needed money and saw this big pile of cash lying around in a government slush fund somewhere. So what really happens instead is that people more or less either pay now or pay in the future. Either we pay for the project, in which case we have to pay the whole bill now, or we don't, in which case people in the flooded community have to pay the whole bill in the future. Given that that's the reality, what's the right way to compare harming people today versus harming them in the future? In other words, what should governments use as what's called the social discount rate? Well, economic ethicists since John Rawls have tended to believe that in policy analysis we should act as if we don't know uh, to what generation, class, etc. we're born into. This is the veil of ignorance. So, for example, we know that people would rather have money now than later, so there's the time preference of money, but it's a funny thing because I'm also very glad that people invested in things like infrastructure in the past. I would way rather have the infrastructure than have had them have the money back in the 50s, so the time preference doesn't really work uh, between people or generations. It only works for an individual. We mentioned earlier that people in the future will be richer than us, and more money improves welfare less if it goes to a rich person than a poor person. Economic estimates are that this factor alone leads to a discount rate of a little less than 1%. Also, if we have more money today, then people in the future will have more money as well because we'll invest some of that and have economic growth. I'm glad today, for example, that people in the past didn't just take all their money and stick it under the bed to save for me because we wouldn't have had all that economic growth and I'd be much worse off, even with all their mattress money. But it won't all go to growth. A lot will just squander today, but that still means that money today is worth a little more than in the future. Then if we add in things like uncertainty and so on, most economists believe that the social discount rate should be somewhere between 1% and 3%, which is usually what we use in the field. We'll leave it there and do some fun calculations in the next one.